Let's travel back in time, way back to the 1830s when even Abraham Lincoln was still a young chap. So it was in 1833 that that phenomenon of phenomenons, Carl Friedrich Gauss, first demonstrated the electrical telegraph for communicating electrically over long distances. And around that same time, Samuel Morse and his collaborator, Alfred Vail, were also working on telegraphs. So they hadn't quite, they didn't quite beat Gauss to the punch, but Morse had been interested in developing, de developing telegraph technology since 1825. Actually, Morse, it's maybe a little known fact that he was actually an accomplished painter up until that time. That was his main profession. And in 1825, he was in Washington and he was doing a, a painting, but he, his home was in Connecticut. And he got a letter in the mail, this was a tragic event. He got a letter in the mail that uh, stating that his wife was deathly ill. And he rushed home, but the letter had come, you know, by horseback. So it took several days to get there. But by the time he got home, tragically, his wife had died and he was he was just devastated by this and he decided to spend the rest of his life developing electrical telegraph technology so they could have fast communications. So Morse, Morse was very interested in this. And so they eventually, along with the help of some others, Morse and Vail, eventually got their telegraph machine working and Morse gets largely the credit for it in the United States. But their real lasting legacy is the Morse code. So Vale and, and Morse both, both worked together on developing the Morse code, the famous Morse code, which is still in use today, actually, in, in certain applications. And so you're familiar with the Morse code, I'm sure. And they, they developed Morse code in order to be able to transmit text messages over the telegraph. And so you can see here, as I'm sure you are well aware, in Morse code, each letter or numeral has, it corresponds to a sequence of these dots and dashes. So we call this sequence of dots and dashes the code word corresponding to that letter. And this, so this Morse code is actually an example of a symbol code. That's what we're going to talk about, symbol codes, or sometimes they're called variable length codes because each of these words, example, you can see in this example, each of these code words has a different length. Now you could think of these each as, you know, you could think of it in, in a couple different ways. You could think of these as being sequence of, of dots and dashes, or you could alternatively think, th think of them as being sequences of zeros and ones. Like this would be like one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, and so on. So each dash has three ones, length of three ones. And in Morse code, there's a space between each letter of, of three uh, the, the, the length of three dots. So it would be like zero, zero, zero before you start the next letter. And between words, it's like seven uh, spaces, seven zeros. So you can think of Morse code as actually a binary, as a, as a symbol code where each letter goes to, or numeral goes to a binary code word. Now note, and by the way, this picture here, this is the the, the key, they call it the key, to, to key in the sequence of, of dots and dashes, or dits and dots, as they say. And this, of course, is Morse code in Morse code. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so now you will notice, as I mentioned, I called it a variable length code, and you will notice, as we, as we noticed earlier, that each of these code words has a different length. And in fact, Vail, Alfred Vail, this dude here, looking very dapper, he chose the the lengths of the code words so that more frequent letters would have shorter code words right because you know if you have a very frequently occurring letter like e for example this shows up very frequently in the english language then you want to have a short code word for that letter because you're going to use it a whole lot and you want your your messages to be rather short on average so he actually looked at the frequency at which different letters occur in English. He tried to estimate their frequencies. And then he chose these, these code words, maybe, you know, he and Morse together, it's, it's disputed who exactly chose them, but, but they chose these code words so that roughly that the shorter code words would be for more frequent letters. Now, of course, you can't have 
you know, not every letter can have a short code word. That's fairly obvious, right? Because there's only so many short code words to go around. So inevitably, some of the letters are going to have to have longer code words. And like, for example, Q, you know, Q has a long one here. Q is a very infrequently occurring letter in the English language. So you may as well stick it with a long code word. So another way to describe what Vale was aiming for by, by, by doing that was that he was trying to compress those messages. He was trying to take English and, and represent it in these sequences of dots and dashes in a way that was efficient as possible, that was as compressed as possible. So he was doing compression when he did this. And so the, these symbol codes, these variable length codes, are one way to do lossless compression. And whether Vale knew it or not, he was actually implicitly modeling the English language using a very simple probabilistic model. And the model he was using was that each letter is chosen identically, is chosen independently and identically distributed according to its probability. And this is what we refer to as a discrete memoryless source. So we now have some terminology that we need to need to say what that all means. So we have some terminology to define here. First, what is a source? So a source, I'll put it here maybe. I oh, will go down here. Source, what is a source? A source is just a sequence of random variables, a sequence of r random variables, x1, x2, up to xn, say. That's all we mean by a source. You know, uh, it's just uh, terminology that we use in this context when we're thinking of these random variables as sort of emitting a sequence of, of symbols. Now, what is memoryless? So I said this is a discrete memoryless source. What is memoryless? Memoryless in this context just means IID. In other words, these, these sequence of symbols, these sequence of random variables, are independent and identically distributed. That's what we mean by IID. And so what is a discrete memoryless source? Discrete memoryless source. Discrete memoryless source. What is that? That is just, of course, well, we might write DMS to abbreviate. That's a sequence of random variables, x1 to xn that are all taking values in some common set, which I'll denote by this script X with a line through it. And their IID, so this is this is the source part, and then the IID, that's the memoryless part. Maybe I'll put IID here. IID. And the discrete part is that this set, is that, that each of them is a discrete random variable. Or in other words, this set is countable. It's either a finite set or it's countably infinite. So it can be put into bijection with the natural numbers. So that is a discrete memoryless source. That's that that's all we mean when we say that. So another sort of uh, way that I may use the, the word source is that I might occasionally just write x, you know, x in, in, in some taking values in some set here, where x is some random variable. I may refer to this as a source. And if I do that, I just mean take a sequence of random variables that all have the same distribution as that guy and make them IID. That would So that would be if I refer to this x as being a a discrete memoryless source just on its own. So that's a little remark. Now another piece of terminology that we will need. So that's sort of the basics. An alphabet. What is an alphabet? Well, of course, you know the, the usual alphabet, but this is going to be a slightly different definition of alphabet. We're going to generalize our notion, our usual notion of the alphabet to just be some set of items, some set of elements. And then we're going to think about stringing those together into sequences of symbols or elements. So, for, so this is just some set of 
elements. It's really just some arbitrary set of elements. Typically, it's going to be a finite set. Almost always, it's going to be, well, either countable or finite set. And we're going to be using two particular, we're going to be using, usually, we're going to have two different alphabets flying around. We're going to have a source alphabet, source alphabet. And I will often denote this by this capital script X. And that's going to be the same X as up here. This is going to be the, the alphabet. This is going to be the set of elements that the random variables are taking values in. Each of these, these, these random variables in our, our sequence here, that's our source. And then we're also going to have a code alphabet. And I'll probably fairly consistently denote this by this script A. So for example, the source alphabet, like you think about in Morse code here, the source alphabet would be all the letters, uh, or rather, yeah, so all the letters, A through Z, and all the numerals, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. So that would be the source alphabet, the set of all those. And the code alphabet, well, depending on your perspective, I think I think the, a, a good way to think about Morse code is as a sequence of zeros and ones. So it would be like 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And so in that case, if you think about it that way, the source, the, the, rather, the code alphabet would be 0 and 1. So it's going to be, we're going to have sequences. We're going to string together these, these, these elements of this alphabet to get our code words. But you can really have any, I mean, this could be, you know, 0, 1, and 2, or 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, or it could be, you know, the, these letters, these alphanumeric letter, uh, symbols. It could be, you know, just some, so some, some set here. Okay. And another piece of notation that we, we're going to, to find useful is if we take an alphabet and we write that to the asterisk, that to the star. So A star, what is that? That we're going to use to denote all the sequences, all the finite length sequences of elements of A. So for example, here, these that would be like all the, all the possible code words that you could get. So this would be, how should I write this? This would be like A1, A2, AN, where maybe I'll use K, I'm using N for something else above, where K is some, some integer greater or equal to zero, and all of the A's are in this alphabet A. So that's for all I. And now note I'm using concatenation here. I could I could equally have equally well have written you know this as a as a little tuple here, a sequence. But I'm gonna use concatenation because that's sort of the that's the the standard thing that people do when they're talking about alphabets and code words and and strings and things like that. So this is a this is a string of letters so to speak from this alphabet. They're not always letters, but you know, we could think about them as as sort of letters in some sense. Uh, by the way, if you are a computer scientist, this star is called the clean star after Stephen Clean. Clean star. <laughs> Sounds like a laundry service. So uh, anyway, so this is some basic some basic terminology and notation that we'll use. And next, we will define uh, symbol code or variable length code, and we'll look at some examples of symbol codes.